and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. We'll be spending most of this show talking about a preventable cancer. We're doing pretty good at recognizing cancer early, but we need to do the best job of preventing cancer, and we'll be spending most of this show talking about that. Colorectal cancer, cancer of the colon and the rectum. 150,000 new cases will be diagnosed this year. There'll be 50,000 deaths, and most of those cancers could be prevented. My guest is Dr. Raj Narayani, board certified gastroenterologist. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about why am I always so tired? A lot of different causes, and we'll go over those with you if we have time. We'll also be talking about a special heart valve, the mitral valve, and what kind of problems it can cause you and your family. We're talking with Dr. Raj Narayani, board certified gastroenterologist, and we're going to be talking about colorectal cancer, cancer of the colon and cancer of the rectum. Raj, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me today. Uh, tell me about in colon and rectal cancer, what's the most important fact if you looked at the whole scheme of things uh, that comes to your mind? You know, it's interesting, um, in, in 2013 now, we have great technology that allows us to actually access where colon and rectal cancer grows, and that allows us to actually prevent this cancer from forming, which is something we can't usually do with other types of cancers. So you say we can prevent it, well, that would be the key word. You know, other cancers we try and find early, we try and diagnose them early, but with colorectal cancer, you can really prevent it? We can, because most colorectal cancers in health develop from a polyp, which is the precursor lesion for this type of cancer. And because you can identify polyps within the colon and remove them safely using a technology such as colonoscopy, we can actually arrest the development of cancer before it even forms. So it's important that people understand they can prevent colon cancer and they need to get uh, colonoscopy done, starting what age usually? Typically at the age of 50. So standard-wise, we're going to say 50 years, and we'll come back to that basically. How many people are going to be diagnosed of uh, colorectal cancer this year? In the United States, about 150,000 to 160,000 patients are diagnosed yearly. And those could be prevented? They can be prevented. And Most of them can be. And you could prevent it by finding? Polyps in the colon. Which will eventually go on and become that cancer. In many cases, yes. How, how many of those 150,000 cases that are found uh, every year will go on to die of colon cancer? Roughly 50 to 60,000 per year. So a substantial number actually will have advanced disease or disease that becomes advanced with time after diagnosis and then lead to death. When, when you do colonoscopy and you find a polyp, what's it look like, Raj? It's usually a bump or a growth. It's often small, but they can be large even at the time of detection. They can be flat or they can be raised and they typically consist of cells of various types. Most commonly, the types of cells that we see are the kinds that already have mutations within their DNA structure and therefore are allowed to grow at a faster rate than normal colon lining. So they will be distinguishable from the normal colon tissue surrounding them and uh, they will often harbor enough mutations to cause continued growth and then develop into cancer. Most of them about the size of a pencil eraser or the size of a grape or the size of an egg when you see a polyp? The majority of polyps are probably about the size of a pencil eraser or even a little bit smaller than that. When you see one, do you usually see more than one in that colon? It varies. Um, many people will have one or two polyps and then on occasion someone who may have predisposing factors such as a family history may go on to develop multiple colon polyps. Now, when you look at the colon, you do colonoscopy, describe what the colon's like to me. The colon is a tubular organ. Uh, it's shaped kind of like a question mark in your body. So it starts at the very bottom, as you know, and it comes up to the left side, swings over and across, and then comes down to the right side of your body. And it ends, or I should say it begins, since you're going backwards, um, where the small intestine joins it. And that's typically in the right lower abdomen. In the right lower abdomen. Now, we've got the small bowel, about 20 feet or so, and it comes into the cecum is it? Is that the is cecum it? is the beginning structure of the colon. It's also where the appendix attaches to the colon as well. And where the small bowel and the cecum join 
you have the ileocecal valve. Now, when you do colonoscopy, you have to go all the way around the curve or that question mark there. Is it easy or hard to get over uh, all the way over to the other side of the colon? In the majority of cases, it's easy, especially if the colon is flexible and a patient hasn't had a significant amount of abdominal surgery. If a patient has had surgery or, for example, has had radiation treatment to their abdomen before, you can sometimes develop adhesions that will fix the colon and make it a little bit, more, a little bit less flexible, and that may make the, the technique a little bit more challenging, but we can usually access the entire colon in 98% of cases. You're looking for polyps. Do you find more polyps in the beginning of the colonoscopy? That would be the rectum and then the descending colon, the parts going down to the rectum. Are more polyps there or the transcending colon that goes across or in the ascending that comes from this? Where do you find the most of them? Well, there's a slightly greater proportion of polyps found both in the ascending or the right side of the colon and in the left side of the colon, and they're both about equal, 35 to 40 percent. The remainder then are in the transverse colon, so that's the least likely place to find polyps. But the right and left colons are the one, the right and left colon segments are the areas we find most of our polyps. When I started training in the 70s, uh, we did rigid sigmoidoscopy, where we just went on the left side of the colon there and the flexible colon is able, is able to do a whole lot more. Is there any reason to do a sigmoidoscopy now? Yeah, the indications are a lot less now, particularly for screening, because we've realized that it's an imperfect test. In fact, you know, what we used to think is that maybe people weren't developing polyps as much in the right side of the colon was wrong. And so now, in order to access the right side of the colon and find the 35 to 40 percent of polyps that we do, you have to do a full colonoscopy. So in, in the modern era, it is an imperfect test. When you're doing a colonoscopy, uh, you're looking through a little scope. Are you, how do you wiggle the, the end of it where the light is around the colon? How do you do that? The, the end of the endoscope instrument um, is flexible and is maneuverable using a steering device that we have. And it allows us to turn left, right, up, or down. And then in combination with that technology, we can also torque the scope or turn it with our hand as we advance it. And that gives us multiple degrees of freedom in order to access this, the colon and, and turn in different directions. So you can get a really good book. What does the colon look on the inside? What's it look like to you, the examiner, the doctor? It just looks like a hollow tunnel or tube, uh -huh. and it has pleats. So you'll see some sacculations. You'll see some areas where you've got to go over a fold, and then you, know, you almost have to go up and down in order to get to uh, the beginning. Any parts of the colon that look different from other parts? So you, if you got on the descending, transverse, or ascending, do those look different? They do, at my, mainly in, in their diameter, their size, their width. Uh, the sigmoid colon tends to be the narrowest part of the colon. It's also a little bit more tortuous, whereas the descending, transverse, and ascending colon segments are a little bit larger in diameter, and they're also straighter in most cases. The cecum looks like a large sac that has a blind end because that's where the colon begins. And then just to one side of the cecum you have the valve that you can quickly go into and enter the small intestine. So you can go backwards up into the small intestines yes, a little can. ways. Can you tell when you're, uh, when you're going from the cecum into the end of the small bowel, the terminal ileum, can you tell when you're there? What's it, well, how can you know? Well, you can because when we get to the cecum, in fact, we usually uh, try to document as much as we possibly can all of the features of the cecum that we expect to see. Convergence of folds, the appendiceal opening, and then the valve itself, which is a very characteristic structure. It's got a very bulbous sort of a prominent feature to it. Almost looks like lips, if you will. So we, when we identify that structure and then we turn the scope and enter it, typically what you'll see is a different appearance to the small intestine. It'll be narrower mm -hmm. and it'll have a very shaggy appearance as the small intestine usually does. We're talking with John David Roddy, a good friend of mine. And John David, y your mother developed a certain cancer. What kind of cancer did she She have? developed colon cancer. Colon cancer in her 60s, and you were in your early, early 30s, 30s or mid-30s, somewhere in there, and you decided it was time to do what? Uh, I decided because of the family history and because her form of colon cancer was an extremely aggressive and rare form of colon cancer and that my family is a carrier of the BRCA2 gene to go ahead and have a colonoscopy done to make sure that I was not in danger of the same fate. How old were you at that time? I was 34 years old. And what did they find on colonoscopy? Colonoscopy number one, I believe they cut four polyps out. 
four polyps at age 34. And we know that polyps go on and develop cancer over time. So that procedure may have saved your life? Absolutely. What did the doctor tell you? When you had four polyps at age 34, how often did he tell you you needed to come back and have an exam? He told me he'd see me next year. See you next year. <laughs> uh, do you still have to get colonoscopy on a regular basis? We typically have done it yearly. If we've had a clean bill, they'll give me three years. Um, I kind of don't like the three-year plan, seeing what I saw through my mother. Um, in my opinion, there's no excuse in dying of colon cancer. Uh, you know, so I try to get back each year. You know, that's such a, a really valid statement. There's no reason to die of colon cancer because these polyps take time to develop cancer. So if you have regular colonoscopy, and in your case, more regular than most people have to have. When's the last time they found a polyp? Uh, I want to say it has been three years since I've done one. Uh, the last one was clean, so I would say it's been close to five years. So the nice thing is we know if they find a polyp, they can take it out and you won't develop colon cancer. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, comfortable. Yeah, it really does. It's an amazing thing that they can do in preventing colon cancer. Uh, anything else you do? You exercise a lot? Yes, sir. Kept your weight good? Try to. Eat good food? Try to do that. Not smoker? No, sir. You know, those are the things we want to do to stay free of cancer as well as regular exams. John David Roddy, you're a good testament to the whole world on the value of colonoscopy. Thank you. We're talking with Dr. Raj Nariani, board certified gastroenterologist. We're talking about colorectal cancer. We're talking about those cancers start with little polyps and if we can find the polyps early, they can be removed during the colonoscopy and prevent cancer of the colon. Now Raj, in the past year, uh, about how many colonoscopies have you personally performed? Um, I've probably performed about 1,500 or so colonoscopies. About 1,500. And of those 1,500, how many have you found polyps? Uh, 50, 100, 700? Um, for most of us, the average detection rate is about 25 to 40 percent. So that's, that's typically the, the rate with which we will all find polyps in people's colons. So out of 1,500, as, high, as many as 600 uh, will have polyps. When, when you see those polyps, you, you said they vary in size. What's a reasonably large one? Grape size, egg size? Grape size, probably. Anything about, uh, that's above about 10 millimeters or a centimeter in size is considered a higher risk polyp. Do you find a lot more little bitty ones or you just can't tell? When you go in, you don't know what you're going to find. No, the majority of polyps we see are little bitty ones, three to five millimeter polyps, which we still remove in most cases. Um, but I would say we probably find polyps 10 millimeters or greater in about 10% of our patients. Now, how do you remove those? Tell me about how you do that. There are multiple different techniques. For smaller lesions, you can simply grab the polyp with a forceps that looks a little bit like a jaw. Is the jaw on the end of the colonoscopy? It's yeah. on the end of an instrument that you advance through a channel that's built within the endoscope. Gotcha. So it goes in closed, and then when it comes out the end of the scope, you open it, and then you put it over the polyp, grab it, close it, and pull it off. Uh, and, and another way to do it would be what? Well, another way to do it would be to put something called a snare around the polyp, which is a little bit like a lasso, but it's got a wire loop. That wire loop can either be used to cut the polyp without using any energy at all, or for larger polyps, you can put the loop around the polyp, close it down, and then pass energy through the wire as well, which will allow you to cut thicker forms of tissue. Now, when you take out a polyp, can you pretty much tell if it's a precancerous, if there's uh, unusual development inside that or you just can't tell without sending it to pathology? You can sometimes, especially if you have high definition technology because you can really see the surface features of the polyp. Polyps that are in the right half of the colon are all more, more likely to be precancerous polyps than not. In the left colon it's a little bit tougher to tell. And then of course the larger polyps that we see tend almost always to have precancerous tissue. You were mentioning about different kind of lights that you have available during the scope that you can flip. Tell me about that technology because that's something I didn't know about. Yeah, in the last five to seven years or so, technologies have been built into these endoscopes that allow us to basically change the light that we shine on the wall of the colon and therefore on the polyps that we see as well. So what might the, the different colors look like to you? So ordinarily when we look at the colon, it's got a salmon orange or pinkish color to it. Uh -huh. Polyps may be anywhere from white to red. 
And then when we change the wavelength of the light that we look at, sometimes it'll confer a brownish color to the colon and then change the color of the polyps to a different contrast so that we can see them with a little greater ease. Do you flip the uh, wavelength of the light length back and forth during the procedure frequently when you're at a suspicious area? When do you, how do you know when to change the light wave? Anytime we see a flat polyp that is a little bit less distinguishable from the surrounding colonic wall or tissue, we might use this technology. So we don't use it in most of our cases, but we do use it for some of those challenging cases where you see a little bit of an irregularity in the wall of the colon, and therefore you're worried you may have a, a very aggressive polyp that isn't forming the way most polyps form. You mentioned earlier that people need to start their colonoscopy at age 50. What are the reasons where somebody might need to start at age 40 or 35 or earlier? People will start at a age younger than 50 if they have additional risk factors for developing colon cancer. And the most notable one is a family history of colon cancer. So if a person has a first degree relative like a brother or sister or a parent, especially if that person developed colon cancer before the age of 60, then it's a good idea to start potentially at the age of 40 or even earlier if the parent or relative had colon cancer at a very young age. Are there other people that there's a high risk? Um, some people that have family histories of polyps, of familial adenomatous polyposis or something like that. Tell me about that. There are some genetic syndromes for polyp formation and because of defective genetics, potentially the colon has a tendency to develop more polyps. And when this happens, you'll see multiple family members sometimes develop polyps. You may see one or two family members who develop you know, thousands, thousands, hundreds of polyps that, that require them to have their entire colon removed. And when you see that, then in some of the uh, additional relatives to that patient, you may start a lot earlier, potentially at the age of 15, 20, or 25. When you look in a colon, when you do colonoscopy, and uh, you see a cancer itself, uh, uh, that means it probably started with a polyp and should have had that colonoscopy done early. What's a cancer look like? It's, it's a, a, a vastly different than a polyp. It, it's, it's more of a mass or a growth that's a lot larger than a polyp. It's typically circumferential, which means it goes around the wall of the colon. It may not completely circle the colon, but it may involve half of the circumference or a, a fair portion of it. Uh, it is typically very red, irritated. It may even have a purplish color to it. And just rubbing a tumor sometimes will cause it to bleed. So it's very fragile. It must be something you don't want to ever see, but you see occasionally. Uh, let's talk about if you see polyps or if you don't see polyps, how often do you recommend somebody comes back for repeat colonoscopy? It depends to some degree on the number of polyps they had and on the size of the polyps they had. So if they had two polyps or less and they were both small, we might be fairly liberal with that patient and say come back in five years. If they have three or more polyps and they're precancerous, then we may shorten the interval down to three years. If any polyp the patient has is greater than 10 millimeters, we might also recommend a three-year follow-up for that patient because those features suggest a higher risk for that patient developing additional polyps in the future. If they have no polyps and they have no additional risk factors, then they may get the ultimate sentence of 10 years, which is great, so. <laughs> yeah, and that's when I had my first one at age 50, and then I had another one at 60. When do you stop if uh, you have one at 60 and there's no polyps, you recommend 70 and that's it, or do you recommend at 70? It's, it's variable from one society to another as far as the guidelines are concerned, but most societies will tell you between the age of 75 and 85, you can start thinking about stopping colonoscopy surveillance. You know, we're living longer and longer. Is there, are we stopping just because it looks like that person is not a polyp former, or it's just that uh, age limits the need to do it after age 75 or so? No, and you bring up a good point. We, we like to consider the patient as an individual. So if the patient is 82 and they're extremely healthy, they don't have many health problems, and they look like they're gonna to live to be 105, then we might still recommend that they come back at an interval that is deemed appropriate for them. So we don't stop purely by, based on chronological age. We certainly consider the biological profile of the patient as well. Must be exciting to have guidelines and to be able to find polyps that you know if they didn't come in, eventually those would have become cancer and the people would have died. Raj Nariana, you're just a great teacher. Thank you so much for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Uh, I really enjoy having you as a guest. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great show. If you have not had your colonoscopy and you're 50, talk to your doctor. You need to get that. If there's a family history, you need to get it earlier. Now you're going to want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about causes of fatigue. Are you ever tired? Wonder why? Uh, we're going to go through 8, 10, 12 different 
causes of people having fatigue, just tired all the time. And if we have time, we'll get to the mitral valve. What are some of the problems with one of the heart valves? Uh, that can mean something to you. You want to stay tuned, a lot of information. I want to thank Dr. Raj Narayani. Excellent discussion on colorectal cancer, age 50. Be sure you get your colonoscopy. Now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, I'm tired. I'm tired all the time. Could you tell me why? <laughs> Excellent question. You know, most everybody gets tired every once in a while. Sometimes uh, it's just part of living. But if you're chronically tired day after day after day, then it most likely is due to something abnormal. Let's talk about some different causes. Number one, you're simply not getting enough sleep. You know, there may be some ball games that you're, wa you're watching on television that keep you up late at nighttime. It may be that you're studying for a test that keep you up at nighttime. It may be that you've got things at work that you're doing at nighttime. Maybe you're doing your computer work. It may be you're catching up on your cell phone and you just don't get to bed on time. So a lot of times it's just because you don't put aside seven to eight hours where you can sleep during the night. That's the most common cause of why I'm tired all the time. Number two, you've got a sleep disorder. It may be obstructive sleep apnea. People that snore, about 45, 50% of those will have sleep apnea. That's where they actually stop breathing. And some people will stop breathing some 30 times, 40 times an hour. So if that happens 40 times an hour, you're essentially not getting any sleep at all. If you find yourself waking up with a gasp or a jerk or somebody tells you you stop breathing while you're snoring at nighttime, you may have obstructive sleep apnea. There's 99 other sleep disorders like insomnia, just can't sleep. Some people go to sleep, they wake up, they can't go back to sleep. Uh, restless leg syndrome, narcolepsy. If you're having trouble sleeping, know that you may need to talk with your doctor about. Another cause is not enough fuel. A lot of people just are trying to lose weight and they don't eat enough. You've got to be sure that you eat to feed the body the fuel that it needs so you won't be tired. Start the day off with a breakfast. Have more protein in your diet. Go ahead and eat snacks, but instead of eating a handful of almonds, eat three almonds. That'll be really enough all you need. So watch what you're eating. Anemia, low blood count, common cause of fatigue. A lot of different causes of anemia. Women that have excessive menstrual cycle, uh, people that don't take enough iron in their diet, people that have bleeding ulcers, lots of reasons why people uh, have anemia. So if you're pale, you're short of breath, and you just don't look like red-blooded pink American person, check with your doctor on anemia. Depression, are you waking up, you just don't feel like doing anything, you've just got the blues and the blahs. Depression is a common cause of people having fatigue. So if you've got no excitement in your life that you don't look forward to doing things, know that that could be a major cause. Then we have thyroid problems. A low thyroid can make us fatigued. People with urinary tract infections, hidden infections can cause uh, chronic fatigue. There's a chronic fatigue syndrome. There's fibromyalgia. People that are having heart disease, they sometimes fatigue is the main problem they have. So if you've got chronic fatigue, see your doctor. It must be worked out and there's usually a cause. Also know that there's a quick fix for most people that have fatigue and that's gradually increasing exercise. Try it, you'll see what it does. Question number two, Dr. Bob, my doctor says I have mitral valve prolapse. Am I gonna die? Well, uh, blood goes to the lungs. It comes back from the lungs to the left side of the heart, the left atrium. And from the left atrium, it goes to the big pump, the left ventricle, through the mitral valve. That mitral valve can be diseased. Now, when the heart pumps, blood out to the rest of the body, then that mitral valve is supposed to close. Sometimes it doesn't close well. It prolapses back from whence it came. It lets a little blood go back into the left atrium. We call that mitral valve prolapse. 
Actually, we see mitral valve prolapse more common in young people than we used to imagine, and especially with some of the tests that are available. So it's not a doom and gloom diagnosis, but you need to talk with your doctor about how bad the mitral valve prolapse is. Sometimes if you have other surgical procedures, you need to be on an antibiotic so the mitral valve doesn't get infected. Mitral valve prolapse, talk it over with your doctor he'll let you know how bad your mitral valve disease is. Well, that's all the time that we've had for this show. Remember those four things that we like to do. Number one is exercise. Be sure that you're exercising. If I had to recommend one thing, exercise is the thing that reduces stress, makes you feel better, helps us lose weight, um, makes us sleep better. So be sure that you're getting your exercise on a regular basis. Get eight hours of sleep. Literature now says seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. Everybody at different ages needs different amount. But if you're getting good sleep, you'll feel better, you'll produce more, you'll be happier, the people around you will be happier. Eat properly, start the day off with a breakfast, have a little protein in your breakfast. As the day goes on, it's okay to snack, snack on small amounts, but eat less food instead of more as you go on during the day. Try and cut out snacks before you go to bed at nighttime. And most of all, what is it we like on the Dr. Bob Show? It's that laughter in your life. Find somebody that you love and tell stories and laugh a lot. You'll feel good and you'll also be healthier.